And I can assure you that after Mike got involved in this, this is one smart man. He is extremely intelligent. As a matter of fact, he just got his master's degree and he did his, he did his thesis on the Camp Lejeune water contamination issue. And once Mike got involved in this, he became my brain. I mean, he's got a big enough head anyhow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Mike. Mike Bartain. Grab my trusty iPad here. Well, well, good evening. I see everyone's kind of shifted over to the left side of the room, so I'll try to talk to everybody here. But um, I'm one of the Lujum babies. Obviously, I'm much older now, but I was born at the base in 1968. Um, my grandfather enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1939 and retired as a major in 1961. My father was a Naval Academy graduate, class of 66, and did his commission in the Marine Corps. Um, they arrived at the base in April of 1967. I was conceived shortly afterwards and then born in the base in January 1968. Uh, for me, Lejeune is just nothing more than a, a name on my birth certificate that I had to bubble in when I was in grade school. Um, when my father got back from Vietnam, we moved to Florida. He resigned his commission, took a job managing a mobile home plant in, in Winter Haven, Florida, and that's where I grew up. That's my hometown. Camp Lejeune meant nothing to me. I, as a matter of fact, the only time I was on the base was the time that I was conceived to the time I was born plus four months. But as you know, many of you, I'm sure most of you all are parents and everything, that time is the most important time of your life. It's when you're made. And if, you're being, if your mother is being exposed to contaminants in the water during that time, all that's going to the baby. Now for me, I grew up a kid, you know, my, I have a, a sister who's two years younger than me. But the whole time I was growing up, I had all, all kinds of odd medical problems. I remember um, when I was a child, I had a skin rash that stayed with me all through my life. I had uh, liver problems and liver readings all through childhood. Matter of fact, my doctor, when I was 17, told me to quit drinking. I didn't drink. But liver issues is one of the telltale signs of the poisoning. I had protein in my urine all through childhood. And you know, I got to adulthood got married, had four kids, and then out of the blue one night, my wife gives me a hug and she feels a bump in my chest. And you know this is all Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Anyway, she felt that bump and thankfully she urged me to go to the doctor, which I did two weeks later. And you know, it was kind of an odd journey because I had to go have a mammogram, which I didn't know men could have. I had to go and do a sonogram, and then they had to do a biopsy, which they take a harpoon about that long and stick it in your chest. It hurts. Then on and my former wedding anniversary, because unfortunately my marriage didn't survive this, but I was diagnosed with male breast cancer. Let me tell you, when I was in college, I had a gun put to my head, and the manager beaten in front of me. I was scared. I remember looking into the, into the chamber of the gun as a revolver, and I could see the hollow points in, loaded in there. And I sat there wondering, am I going to hear the shot or do you die first? And let me tell you, there's nothing more terrifying than sitting in the chair and your doctor saying, you have cancer and it's serious. And on top of that, being a father of four kids between 7 and 17 and wondering, are they going to make it? What are they going to do without me? I did my mastectomy, they removed, by the way, for those you don't know, they cut me from here to here, removed my right chest. And one lymph node. Thankfully for me, the cancer didn't spread. The lymph node was hard, but they said it wouldn't involve a cancer. But they told me I had to go through chemotherapy. And like Jerry mentioned, I was walking out of the doc doctor's office getting ready for chemotherapy, and my father called me. And as you all Marines know, um, you usually don't hear emotion, especially out of my father's voice and things. When he called me, I thought something happened to my mom, and he asked me, where are you at? So I'm at the doctor's office, he says, get your ass home and turn on CNN. And that's how I found out about Camp Lejeune. 
That was in 2007, 10 years after the first announcements that Jerry found out. I had no clue. Nobody from the government called my family or told me that I had been exposed. If it hadn't been a hug from my wife, God knows what would have happened. Now, like Jerry mentioned, you know, I recently finished my degree. Uh, Jerry calls me the brain, but you know, I, I did a lot of the historical research. My, my bachelor's degree is in history. I used to be a school teacher, and I spent 22 years as an insurance adjuster with State Farm and USAA. And I went through and talked to Jerry. He sat up with me to two, three in the morning sometimes on the phone, putting together what happened and then taking the documents. By the way, there's a website we have. It's called The Few, The Proud, The Forgotten. Jerry started that site, what, 2004? And on that site, we have a timeline of events that is all annotated. And you can actually click on links on that timeline that will bring up the actual Marine Corps, EPA, state of North Carolina uh, documents. And you can read for yourself what's going on. And it's, it's mind-boggling. And like Jerry, I've testified twi twice in Congress. He's done nine times. But this story has taken 25 years to get to the point that we're at now. And the important thing of where we're at now is we have an opportunity for justice. And one of the other things that people don't realize is that this issue is not unique to Camp Lejeune. It just didn't happen to us. Jerry often says that the number one polluter in the country is the Department of Defense. There are about over 133 major DOD installations that are listed as Superfund sites. If we don't stand up and take advantage of the opportunities that are given us now and hold the government accountable for what's happened from 1953 to 1987 at Camp Lejeune, it's going to happen again. It already has. Everyone hear about what happened in Red Hills last year? Pearl Harbor, the fuel tanks that the Navy installed at the same time they installed Camp Lejeune leaked and got into the potable water system aboard the base. They had to bring families out of the housing, provide potable water, and the, the Navy says, well, it wasn't so bad. And then as, they, as the group is diving into the documents, they find the same thing. So that's another aspect of our story, what we're doing. Now, you know, the, the fight that we've been it's been a long fight, and we've got two years now to bring this home and get it concluded. One of the people that helped us in this fight is Erin Brockovich. We actually met her in 2010 or 11, I forgot now. Yeah, we, we were up on Capitol Hill. You know, Jerry, Jerry and I used to do a lot of trips. He, he memorized the roads, so he actually slept when he drove to Capitol Hill, and I slept on the other side because I had to drive from Tallahassee, Florida to, to North Carolina and then slept on the way up there. But about 2010-11, Erin joined our fight, and she got us into the White House to meet with the Office of Management Budget so we could work on getting the, our first bill passed. You know we got two bills. The first one was the Janie Ensminger Act, named after Janie. That was done in 2012. And then the second bill is the Camp Lejeune Justice Act, which was passed in August of this year. Both Jerry and I were at the White House for both those signings. But anyways, Aaron got us going <clears throat> on the first trip there. And then in 2014, which is probably the darkest day of our movement here because the Supreme Court in 2014 shut the door on us and said, basically denied our rights. Aaron was with us at the Supreme Court trying to, to fight that too. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Aaron here and let her talk about Camp Lejeune and what she's done. Everyone, Almost, she needs no introduction. Everyone's seen, by the way, who's seen the movie Aaron Brockovich? Okay. So without further ado, here's Aaron. <laughs> 